Hello everybody, it's Aviator Joe, and while I wait for flying weather, and wait, and wait, and wait, I figured I'd go over what my design logic was for the control panel in my little red rocket, the Aeropratt A22 LS. My experience with panels started with the plane I learned to fly in, a flight design CTLS around 2011. The plane came equipped with the Dynon D100 EFIS, a D120 EMS, and a Garmin 496 GPS, so I grew up, as it were, using a glass cockpit. In addition to the CTLS, I also rented a Technum P92, which had analog engine instruments, but also featured a TS 7-inch EFIS and a wonderful Garmin 695 GPS. When I transitioned to my Quicksilver MX Ultralight, my cockpit instruments consisted of a Hall's airspeed indicator, which is basically a tube with a hole in the bottom and a little red disc that went up and down depending on the airflow. Don't laugh, it worked. After flying using the Force for a couple of years, I decided I wanted that steam gauge experience, so I put in a full-fledged instrument pod. But old habits die hard, and soon I had a small Android phone running PPGPS clamped to the MX. Its main use was recording my GPS track and displaying my ground speed and bearing. When I decided to commit to a brand new aircraft, it was obviously open season on what sort of instrumentation I was going to fly with. I was a little leery of the trend towards total integration. It sounds great to be able to control a beacon, radio, autopilot, GPS, and view flight and engine data on the same screen. But after decades of designing software, I knew the evils of functionality that is buried under menus. Also, certain functions in the cockpit have a user interface tradition. An example of this is selecting frequencies using concentric rotating knobs. I was getting the Rotax 912 IS, and Aeropratt offered a complete Dynon Skyview HDX system that was well integrated with that engine. So I did some research and was very happy to find that Dynon has a very touchy-feely sort of interface. While you can select and operate things by touching the screen, there are eight hardware push buttons and two rotary controls mounted on an angled shelf on the bottom of the unit. And so you have something to steady your hand while you are touching the screen, the sides and the top have a substantial edge that you can grip with your fingers. But what really got me going is the hardware control modules that provide a more tactile and traditional way of working. These standard size units can control radio and audio, set heading, altitude bugs, and barometric pressure and control autopilot functions. So I was sold. I spent almost 25 hours in Aeropratt America's A22 last year, so I got to see what I liked and I didn't like about their setup. That in turn drove my decisions. I decided on one 10 inch Skyview screen. I will fly alone most of the time and most of my passengers are non-pilots. So I wanted to place the screen as close to the center of my field of vision as possible. This puts the information I use the most right along my sight line, especially helpful during landings. Secondly, it moved the radio audio stack closer to my line of sight. One issue with the other setup was the LCD screen on the radio panel was hard to see at times because it was at a sharp viewing angle. Why then, you would rightly ask, didn't I put the sky view right to the left edge of the panel? First, the heater control can only be in the position that it is in, and it takes some of the real estate away from anything else. But the main reason is that I wanted the heading, altitude, and barrow knobs to be right next to the sky view's left knob. I can then configure the left sky view knob to control the vertical speed bug. This way, all my bug settings are conveniently clustered together. 
On the upper left are the two lane status lights. Lanes, in Rotax jargon, are the two different control paths for the engines. If both of these lights are on, it's time to land ASAP. Next to that is the trim indicator, which indicates the position of the trim flap. As it turns out, this was one of my mistakes. It isn't really needed. More on that later. I place my two analog backup instruments to the right of the radio panels. One is a standard airspeed indicator. Now planes are not boats, so I prefer miles per hour. But the aviation gods have spoken, and my speed and distance world is now and forever nautical. The altimeter deserves a special mention. It's called a non-sensitive altimeter, mostly because it only has one needle, not the three that the hoity-toity sensitive altimeters have. Most of the altimeters I have used were non-sensitive, and so I am just used to looking at one needle. Since these are to be used in an emergency, I did not want any misinterpretations. Below the sky view unit is a backup slip indicator. I almost did not get one, but in an emergency, I want to have as much help as possible in keeping the plane coordinated. To the left of that is an autopilot disconnect button, which does what it says. To the right of the slip indicator is the ELT unit control panel. Next to that is a jack for our USB memory stick. Dynon uses it to load software and FAA database updates into the Skyview's computer. You don't have to have one to use the Skyview, but if you want all the standard FAA charts and plates, you need to keep the USB stick plugged in. Finally, there is a push to talk button, mostly for passenger use, but also for a backup. Since the A22 only has one control stick, it's a good idea to have one on the panel. Usually, all the avionics are controlled by one switch. I decided that I wanted the two transponders on separate switches. Why? I like the ability to turn off individual systems for troubleshooting and shutting down in case of erratic operation. Yes, there are two separate fuses for these systems, but I'd rather not have to pull off the fuse cover and hunt around for the proper fuse during a stressful situation. The two flights I've made so far has validated these decisions. In general, I am happy with the layout. However, I did make one mistake. The Dynon Autopilot has two modes. One is tuned for VFR flying and one for IFR. This is the Autopilot panel. I almost got it because I liked the idea of having an actual hardware level button. It's not too hard to access it on the sky view, but a button you just push. At the time of my decision, that button did not work with the simplified autopilot mode, so I decided not to get it. However, after the panel was set in stone, I found out that the autopilot panel also implements automatic trim when you're on autopilot. I was even more disappointed when I found out that a recent software update allowed the use of the level button on the simplified autopilot mode. At some point, I may correct this. I would have to move the lane status light somewhere else and get rid of the trim indicator. Then I could cut out an opening for the autopilot panel. Wiring is just plugging in a D connector to a bus. But how do I know what position my trim tab is in? Turns out, the sky view provides a display widget that does just that. The indicator signal would just have to go into a pin on the Dynon system. Oh well. Well, that's enough for today. I'll make a follow-up video that outlines the airframe options I chose and why I chose them. Until then, happy landings.